Hello everyone, welcome to the Junkyard Love Podcast. It's me, your host, Ed, Ed, and Eddie. I'm happy that you are here. This is an episode with John LeFaber. It's wonderful. He is a poetically and externally successful man with a checkered past. He's been a taxi driver, a lawyer, a convict, an activist, a third of a billionaire, a musician, an author, an environmentalist, a philanthropist, and more. The multimillionaire Jailbird owned 27% of the PayPal of online gambling. He's worked with Grammy-winning Ward Grammy English. He's worked with Grammy-winning music producers and co-founded Dsmog.com, a blog dedicated to exposing climate misinformation campaigns. So yeah, we had a good convo. Um, you can read the description for more of kind of what we talked about. Uh, this episode is actually a bit old. This is technically a year and a half old, which seems kind of crazy to be posting something that old. But I assure you, outside of me mentioning, hey, I just moved to Austin four months ago and me saying this now, there's nothing that, that seems to date it, um, as will be with these other episodes. I have a few more episodes to post, as I've mentioned on here on these little intros on the podcast, um, of things that I've recorded. And I'm a bum, and so I never posted them. And they've just been sitting, waiting to be edited, and um, I haven't, you know, brought them to the forefront of my time. So, anyhow, this is the intro. Uh, I hope everyone's well. Uh, man, I, I need to do an episode where I just kind of, like, check in, where I just, like, talk Theo Vaughn style to the camera and just without me trying to, you know, teach you something or present a guest or, you know, uh, tell you I am something that it's so important and have you listen to me for um, way too long. I should just do an episode where I just where we just catch up because things are going good. Things are going good. I'm out here in Austin still. Um, uh, it's been kind of a few dry months as far as work and uh, events and whatnot. I work in live events still. Um, but uh, things are beginning to pick back up. It's kind of the, the, kind of the case with the winter months in live events. But um, yeah, moving along, hanging out otherwise, writing, creating a lot. Hanging out, existing, kind of getting a little more stable, reading a lot. Uh, yeah, dude. Anyway, we'll get going with the episode. Anybody, feel free to reach out. I appreciate you listening. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're drinking water. I hope you're stretching. I hope you're gaining something from this damn podcast. Um, I spend so much of my time on this podcast. I really spend a lot of time on this. So I just, anytime anybody gains anything from it, I'm like, yeah, dude. I love doing it. So, you know, I'm going to keep doing it. But, the fact that anybody has any sort of positive benefit from me yammering and stammering and whatnot is crazy. So anyway, here's the episode. I love you. Good job. Hello and welcome to the Junkyard Love Podcast. holy shit i'm late (laughs) no yeah i always just try to hit that right at the beginning because i have had times where i have actually forgotten until a couple minutes in and i'm like oh that's that's great i gotta hit record late so i just always try to hit it at the beginning so hey john how are you man very nice to meet you jacob i'm uh, pleased to be here this morning where you're are you um you're in central where where boats are you i'm I'm coming to you from austin texas actually oh yeah i hear a lot about you guys Are (laughs) Yeah, yeah are you staying healthy yeah, yeah, I've I've been staying pretty healthy. I'm pretty new. I'm pretty new to the uh, Austin world. I'm uh, I've only been here for about four months. Oh, well, good for you. Where are you from? Uh, originally from Washington State. Oh yeah, I'm just across the border from there. In uh, you ever hear Salt Spring Island? I you guys have so. the, you guys have the San Juans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those islands continue on our side of the border, and the, we call them the Gulf Islands. And I'm on. I you know I can if I if I climb up the mountain. You know, if I climb up a hill here, I can see San Juans. Oh, that's um, cool. Have you uh, always been there? Is that where you were born and raised? No, uh, no, I was born in Ontario. My dad was a soldier. Um, okay. But uh, my mom was raised in Calgary. My dad died when I was about three, you know, oh, wow. in an automobile mishap. 
and uh, my mom moved back to her hometown, Calgary. So I spent most of my, you know, um, developmental years in, in Calgary, which is a beautiful city. I don't know if you know much about it, but it's um, about um, an hour, about an hour from my high school parking lot was Banff. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and so we <laughs> pull into the, you know, the parking lot and go, okay, what's it going to be? School or Banff? <laughs> right, right, right. It's, oh. it's, a bit, it's a bit like Denver, I guess, in some ways, you know, situated uh, on the eastern slopes of the mountains. Do you see what I mean by that? Yeah. Yeah, 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 I do. I uh, I definitely, I, I think I prefer, I mean, I've only been here for a few months down in, down in Texas, but I, um, I definitely realize how much I really value the weather and everything over there. Obviously, it's been, been hot over here, so it's just kind of a little turned up, but uh, just the, the beauty of all the greenery. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and being able to have the elevation gain, the mountains, it's, it's something that you don't, you take it for granted until you're not around it. And you're like, oh, I kind of wish that I had some mountains and some greenery around me. I live in an island called Salt Spring Island. And it's about uh, two and a half hours to Vancouver by ferry and, and driving. Uh, but it's about 25 minutes to downtown Vancouver by float plane for about a hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. And um, so we're, you know, if you take float planes into account, you know, we reckon that we live in the best neighborhood in Vancouver. We keep a little apartment in downtown Vancouver too, because I have grandchildren there and, you know, it's, you know, the same old typical story, except, you know, we're super lucky. We get to do it. We get to do it this way. You know, I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking out here at the tide coming in and, um, you know, watching kingfishers and herons, uh, they, you know, serve themselves up at the, they, they, can you imagine what it'd be like to be a, a, like a, um, you know, a heron, you just stand there and you stand and you stand silent and still. And um, wait to see what the universe serves up at your feet. Yeah, w- w- without <laughs> completely thinking about it every two seconds about what's about to happen. Standing still is so actually you had I heard you mention in a podcast uh, I was listening to. And I think you said it was a quote from your book. It was like, um, I might even jotted it down. Oh, be still, but still be. Yeah, be but, still yet, still be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uh, Yeah, that, we'll that's, talk about it. We'll talk a little bit about that today if you want. I'm. Yeah, well, I just know you don't you don't want to jump into these thing, things right away because then you don't yeah, say yeah. them after the tape. Yeah, or I guess we are recording, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, we're recording. But I mean, you, I, I you can have edit to decide the beginning, when you, whatever. But yeah, sure, you have to decide. Yeah, 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 right. Okay, well, in the end, be still yet, still be. That's a big part of um, the things we find when we do that uh, is what join us together as uh, uh, equals the world over. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's uh, let's find a way to point towards that. Uh, be still, but yet still be. Um, so, what's your? I mean, how'd you get? So, you wrote that. You've written books. Um, you were also talking about how it's a it's a hundred a hundred dollar plane that's different than flying uh, uh, private jets and, and whatnot from from your past. You had experience with jets, right? Yeah, I owned one. Yeah, yeah. So you owned a jet. So yeah, that's a, a different world. So yeah, how about just uh, let's start with a little bit of your bio, like kind of what's what's a little bit of your background and what kind of led you into into writing and um, advocating for the things that you do now. Well, um, I was raised in the Catholic tradition, and um, you know that was in you know I was born in 1951, so I'm you know I guess an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> I was born and um, raised in the Catholic tradition, uh, you know, and the, 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 the biggest take I had on that for the first half of my life was that I was a rebel against it. Um, mm. um, I became a, an acid head, you know, I was like, we, we would, uh, we, we'd line up at the record shop to get the new um, Jefferson Airplane 45. Okay. Do you know what a 45 is? <laughs> Vinyl? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm up. actually a DJ, so oh, I, yeah, I, I yeah. don't use vinyl, but uh, but I have been a DJ for 10 years. I'm more of a digital DJ, but yes, carry on. So and that part of my life uh, pretty much laid the, the groundwork for all of the my, my whole v- vision of what it means to be a human being in the universe. Um, you know, you, it's, one, it's one thing to uh, get a glimpse of it. It's another thing to actually live it. And that's, you know, what I've been spending the rest of my life trying to do is, um, um, you know, real realize in, in not, not realize in the way of coming aware of it but make real it within myself mm-hmm. the things i understood that i could be when i was quite young um you know i don't think i don't think i've learned anything that is of fundamental importance in my life since i was 17 and did a whole bunch of too much acid one, one night <laughs> <laughs> yeah suddenly you realize what you really are and there's nothing else that's really gonna gonna trump that 
What? Yeah. So you were you were seventeen when you started doing LSD acid? Uh, I I might have I might have been at the very end of sixteen. Uh, do you do you ever think <laughs> about how if you had never done it, especially at a young age, mm -hmm. how different your life would be? Like it would it would be just. I, I I used to imagine utterly different, but I'm I'm not so sure anymore. You know, there are lots of people who have um you know. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't hope this doesn't sound too preposterous, but you know, to, to wind, there's lots of people who wound up more or less where I have, who've never done anything like that in their life. There's okay. lots of, there are lots of ways we can um, awaken that. Yeah, there yeah. I go, that miracle that dwells within us all. <laughs> I love it. I love and, it. And, and that's one of them. Neil Young, uh, made, in one of his songs, he says, you know, when, when the aimless blade of silent of science crashed the pearly gates and so it was like you know just by, on, by blind luck one day somebody ate some air got fungus and the next thing you knew they realized they were you know godly yeah yeah <laughs> have, have you ever uh have you ever looked into the stoned ape theory at all have you ever heard of that i have heard i don't know much about it though tell me oh man i think that i've butchered it on this podcast more than once but um, i learned about it from terence mckenna talking about it essentially um when we were apes it's kind of a theory of, of how consciousness may have developed or like how our, mm -hmm. how our language and, and linguistics developed. Came out of the trees as apes. We started looking for food, foraging, and we started flipping over cow pies, following cow pies. We started finding uh, these, these mushrooms. And, mm -hmm. and obviously, we don't have a... I don't know if in this scenario we have totally a conscious mind at that point, but it did make us better at hunting. It made our visual acuity better. It made us a better community. I think Terrence McKenna talks about how it uh, it likely led to a lot of like orgiastic communities. And so that brought brought more people together, expanded. So just kind of like made culture this thing um, from apes hopping out of trees and finding psilocybin and psilocybin mushroom and just keeping following that. Um, you, you'll definitely have to look up Stone Ape Theory after this. Yeah, no, I've I, actually I, out of it, but. I've made notes about it before, but never. Yeah, thanks for the encouragement. I will follow up on that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm reading a book now about uh, it's called uh, The Immortality Key. Uh, Brian uh, Mayeski. Yeah. yeah, I can never say his last name. I, I didn't get through that. Um, it's it's very dense and but it's very very profound. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm probably like halfway through it. What what do you think so far? Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, I, it, it's, it's too bad the guy didn't, you know, fall off the wagon and actually try it once. I know. But, I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting for him to. I'm waiting for like this YouTube video of him like, all right, last night I did acid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't, <clears throat> I'm a little bit reluctant to pitch it because um, it's, um, uh, it, it can be, um, I don't, I'm, I'm sure you've read it in a book, but it can be a, a disturbing place to go and we need to be well prepared for it. And, um, mm. and you know, it's not, it, 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 um, it, it depends on what you bring to the party. Right. And if you, if, if, if we still have issues with our, you know, mom, that <laughs> they'll cause, show their face. <laughs> yeah. They, they'll, they'll definitely uh, stare us down in the moment when we want it the least. And, um, you know, it's a, but on the other hand, it's a profoundly uh, powerful mechanism for getting to know ourselves the way we really are. Mm. You know, there's a at the end of my book, uh, there, I, I two quote I, I quote two people throughout my book that are uh, not in fashion anymore. One of them is Adam Smith, and the other one is Jesus of Nazareth, mm. and they were two actually very very stoned motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm going to read you something um, Jesus said. Or, there's a guy named Thomas who the Gospel of Thomas has never been embraced by the Catholic Church, but it's a very, very stoned thing, and I and I, I just love it. I love you know I was I've, I've been thinking about doing you know a, a book on my interpretations of what those very myst mysterious things that he said. But yeah. he is said by Thomas to have said, "Let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled." When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished and he will rule over the all. So hmm. kids, don't drop acid until you're ready to be troubled. <laughs> <laughs> but know that, you know, when we realize the fundamental things about ourselves, we realize, you know, among other things, how uh, um, thoughtless we've been to so many others in the world. Here we are you know, the um, uh, top 20% of the world were more or less demographically, socioeconomically, um, taking for granted 
um, things that would be utter, utterly miraculous to you know the starving lady in Sudan. And um, we take them utterly for granted uh, without thinking for a moment um, if we have actually if if there's a, if there if there are dues to pay for that kind of beauty that we experience in our in the life we take for granted here in Western society. You know, you might have heard me say, <clears throat> yeah, I want you know you. Uh, as many times as as you've hacked up the the, the uh, what is it the naked ape? No, what's the ape? The uh, oh, stoned ape. Stoned, stoned ape. ape. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I've hacked up this one. But um, freedom that you know the freedom the freedom that we enjoy in our society um, that we've you know we've been told since we were children that it was you know it, it comes at a cost and the cost is the highest cost. Uh, you know, of course. You know what they meant was giving your life fighting in wars to protect freedom mm -hmm. um and uh that it doesn't make that much sense to me because the um you know first of all maybe one in two hundred fifty thousand people die <laughs> or i don't i don't really know how many i mean it is everybody else gets it for free that didn't make sense for me but so i started to think about it more and um there is a cost for freedom and i think the cost is that we have to um uh, strive every day to assure that we're on the track of providing to all others who are less fortunate than us the same benefits that we take for granted in our life every day. Right. And if we do that every day, then we've earned our freedom. But if we do not, you know, the way, the way I, in, in that same book that says, be still yet still be, uh, it says, um, those who are content with the benefits of freedom, but are careless of what others less fortunate um, must endure have not earned our freedom. Uh, we've only taken liberties. We've taken liberties. I like that. Wow. Okay, so, so, so uh, paying the price of freedom is to strive to make sure that every, the, you know, the 80% in the world that don't enjoy what you and I are enjoying right now right. are getting closer to enjoying it than all of them themselves. You know, when, yeah. the, the, when the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. First of all, you know, quaintly, they called people men <laughs> we think i think they meant people actually they they, they really did mean white men but <laughs> we, yeah, we know now yeah. we, there's an extension we, yeah we know now that uh, it, it, it is quite quite a bit how may i say this broader than that <laughs> yeah yeah um um hey do we but uh, it does mean all it, it does mean all and, and now on all means everybody everywhere i can we can, i'd like to talk about that more if you feel like it yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I was just, I mean, down that same road, I was kind of thinking about, I've actually recently been kind of rethinking what freedom means to me lately. Um, mm -hmm. And not not in this like, yeah. you know, running around the parking lot with an American flag. I'm not trying to like talk about like that. It just, um, I, I had a podcast guest, uh, his name was Bradley, and he was talking about um, like how much he values freedom. And like, he's like freedom of time, freedom of choice. Um, it, the way that he broke down the word freedom and what it really means, I, I started to realize, oh, I actually do value that very much. And I was thinking also, um, at, at a young age, I was very drawn to like the rebels of music, you know, rock. And I was, uh, mm -hmm. War Warped Tour for me, which isn't that like that edgy, I guess, but um, just all these artists who were, who were, they were breaking things. They were, they were, they were on stage saying things into the mic that I'm like, you're allowed to, you're allowed to say that. And it's like, Oh yeah, that's that's what this thing is. We are allowed to say that. Oh yeah, like we're not supposed to just listen for what's right and then we like lean into what we think is is. So, freedom. What, what does it mean? Like you, you've also had you know financial freedom. So, do you think that your definition of freedom or your internal like um, dialogue when it comes to the word freedom has changed since when you were a younger kid? And now, and maybe, maybe even like, what does freedom really mean to, mean to you now? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure it has changed, but essentially, it comes to the same thing. I just realized more things about it. The the the, the, the things that we take for granted about freedom have have implications, and it's the implications <laughs> that I've been, you know, embracing and you know, at first grappling with, and then embracing. But the um, I think all of the things that we enjoy in our day-to-day -day life in, um, you know, the West, we we'll call it the West, I don't know what to call it, you know, um, the society created by white patriarchy. <laughs> I think all of the things that we take for granted in that society are, are the key, key elements of freedom. Let me go through them. Um, uh, security and uh, integrity of the person, respect of the person, 
uh, access to reasonable access to food, clothing, and shelter, access to the tools of self-improvement and to health, access to basic finance and justice, and access to a healthy environment. So we, in our society, we talk about some of those things, but not all of them. But we do take them all for granted, more or less. And, uh, and you know, I think we should, because I think they are the basic elements of freedom. And we, if, we, if, if we proclaim that we are defenders of freedom, we should understand it. But I think that, you know, those elements in our society are, you know, the uh, fruit of freedom. Uh, you know, the juice is worth the squeeze. Does that ring a bell? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's something I think I heard you say. Um, the, uh, and, you know, if we, if we are entitled to them, and I think we are, you know, I think we're properly entitled to those things, then the, the question becomes, well, if we are, are why, what distinguishes us that we're entitled to them, and other, but others are not? Mm-hmm. And that's a very, very difficult um question to answer and the best I can do with it is there is no there's, there's nothing to distinguish us you know us in this in the um you know the starving people in the deserts of uh in Somalia you know they um we all have the same you know capacity to dream and the same capacity capacity to be disappointed and those um those those, those are the things I think that make us responsible to go out and deliver what has befallen us to all of all others as well because we had because of being being compassionate beings we understand that they have the same capacity to be disappointed as we do and if we were in their position we would be fucking well disappointed that's for Mm -hmm. sure Mm -hmm. you know it would be you know we would be suicidal if we lived in uh many of us would be because it just could not bear it and Mm -hmm. um no, and I don't think this is something that's going to change in my lifetime. I don't know how much time I got left, but a lot less than you do. And mm-hmm. I was thinking the other day, you know, you know, a long time. Well, I don't. I think it was a short time from 1969 until today. You know, I think it was. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> for so, whatever reason, that time frame was real fast for me. <laughs> yeah, and so if that, you know, if that, if that, if that's a short time, imagine how short. The time is that I have left in this world because <laughs> I sure don't have 50 years left. Right. Yeah. So, um, but I'd, I'd like to, uh, if, if I, if I leave a legacy, what I'd like it to be is impress people with the responsibilities that come with freedom. The one thing that's really changed for me about freedom is understand. I hated the word responsibility when I was a kid, you know, cause I kind of thought that, you know, responsibility, well, isn't that just what, isn't that, you know, isn't that what just, you know, it's why, why should we make it a duty? It's what responsibilities are things that compassionate people will think of themselves anyways, <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, look after her, but, um, I've, I've become to I've come, I've come to embrace the idea of responsibility, but the responsibilities of freedom um, are um, ignored by by many in our society, and uh, you know they they are content with what freedom has dropped in their lap, and uh, and quite thoughtless about other people in the world who um, must endure uh, with almost infinitely less <laughs> than right. we have, right? Like nothing. <laughs> And, yeah. and so, and um, it's a, it's a huge, it's a tall order. It's very audacious. And I don't expect really people to um, uh, fall for this quickly because my experience is, is that they don't, but um, you know, when we'll look at it this way, I, we, we spoke of Adam Smith and, uh, uh, and before, and, you know, John Stuart Mill was a buddy of his and they, they those guys were sort of the in, initiators of the, um, uh, the concept that individuals have certain uh, are entitled to certain levels of respect and you know rights and what have you, and you know here we are 250 years later, Jacob, and uh, you know about 10 percent of the people on the planet actually buy that now. Mm-hmm. So you know, and things happen much more quickly now. So my idea is that you know if um, but you know I already know people have not embraced my ideas rapidly. <laughs> Um, it, it would be a wonderful thing, you know, uh, at some, you know, when I'm, you know, floating around on one of those clouds up there with Van Gogh and the rest of them, mm-hmm. you know, um, the, the, uh, to, to, to realize that, uh, you know, people were saying, you know, that your grandfather, I had a, he actually had a, a hold of something there. <laughs> uh, that's a nice thing to strive, to strive for. I like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's like that. What, what's the analogy where you, uh, you, you plant seeds not so you can... It's, it's basically planting a tree so your grandchildren can sit in the shade. You know, right. and, and I, I yeah, think that's, that, that's, a, that's a great mindset, you know, where our culture now, you know, especially with young people, and I don't know if it's a phase or if it's just something like we're just seeing a lot, but it's very like uh, we're instant gratification. We want to see our results now. Um, we don't seem to think much like we think out of like this week or next week or this year or whatever, but we don't really be able to we, we don't really seem to think long term of our of our actions and reactions. We kind of like assume that some you know magic uh steward pilot has has control of the whole ship and you know someone is steering earth in the right direction and we're going to be fine we're just going to do what we want but there is i think a uh, responsibility again of of really trying to think of like how our actions and what we do and what we plan on doing and what we talk about and what we plan on talking about um affects the next generations like we we must mm -hmm. think in that way or mm -hmm. it's kind of kind of i mean it seems game over if not you know we're not gonna we're not gonna last incredibly long if we don't um think about the future once in a while you know well and 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 plan how it should be right plan how it might be yeah. we're just gonna you know, let it happen it, yeah we should we should we should imagine you know, what what a, 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 a the future we would yearn for looks like and um 100%. And, so, and some of us will yearn for um you know yachts filled with hookers <laughs> <laughs> others of us will have, um know uh, you know either by experience or by having read it in a book that um that wears very very thin very very quickly yeah you know those things you know i uh i you know i had two houses on on, on the beach in malibu and i had you know at the same time <laughs> and i had closets full of clothes that you know still had price tags on them and you know that sort of thing Dry, cars cars that you, i didn't even have license plates on yet uh, and um and all your that, problems that, weren't that, solved <laughs> yeah you know you, you'd think but um very quick i i was fortunate when you know when i came to wealth because i was you know i was you know in my 50s uh and um so i had some opportunity to consider what it really means you know i spent most of my life thinking that you know uh, you know if, if 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 a guy's rich he's probably a dick and then i became to the point well you know uh, just because he's rich he might not be a dick i don't know what else he does with his time and his money that sort of thing um but eventually you know i've come to the view that um you know wealth is going to be super important to accomplish all the things that i've got in mind for earth <laughs> uh but you know just i was but to complete the idea we were talking about um very quickly i got to the point where you know buying a, a, a new you know alpina roadster <laughs> was um you know not that big of a thrill anymore and i found it was it became evident to me that you know the 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 the, the, the thing that got me the most high was sh sharing that with others so i would take mm -hmm. you know my friend family friends and take their kids to rodeo drive and start making piles in all the stores <laughs> you know wind up spending like thirty thousand dollars on stuff for for you know the kids and the family and, the, and you know and just and, and they and you know people just loved that so much and jacob the the, the dividends of that you know the dividends of that kind of it's not it's not you know it's kind of ill-conceived generosity but still it's generosity um are are just magnificent they last forever you know people mm -hmm. think that you know the gratitude that comes from g giving people that thrill is a way bigger rush than you know hiding another million under a rock somewhere you know stuffing it under a mountain somewhere right. and calling it yours yeah. you know that's, yeah, one, yeah. that's one of the things i like to tell people that you know hoarding ho hoarding is the wanking of wealth uh -huh. right okay, but yeah. it's a it, it lasts about that long you know you, then you have to hoard some more <laughs> And then, and then it lasts about that long but yeah. you know the making love of wealth is the sharing of it and mm -hmm. you know the the mysterious astonishing thing about that is that when we do that we don't wind up with less we wind up with much much more and i'm not talking just about more in our hearts but i am talking about that too i think as we develop people the world over in the third world we called it when i was a young guy i don't know what they call it now but you know the places you know if if we develop those human resources so those people can look look after themselves well um 
they become more productive. And I remember productivity it used to be a word we talked <laughs> about, you know, productive people create wealth. And, uh, you know, I, I talked to some, some, you know, pretty right wing guys, you know, um, uh, about, about this, but they agreed with me that, um, wealth theoretically is infinite. And, you know, when, when we improve the human resources that are, uh, the 80% of the world that are not completely, um, uh, tuned up as they could be to be pulling on the oars, <laughs> right? Uh, when we do do that, the, the world is going to be so much more wealthy. And all these guys who think that, ho you know, hoarding and, 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 and stuffing all their shit in the vault is um, mm -hmm. make <laughs> is an improvement are going to be surprised to find out that actually they're going to be living in a world full of rich people and then nobody wants their money anymore. They've got their own. And you can, you know, if you... You don't have to share much of it to make that happen either. You know, I really like Elizabeth Warren's idea of the wealth tax. It's, it's a brilliant idea taxing, uh, what is it, uh, estates that are have a value of above $50 million and you only tax them on the, the amount of that, above that $50 million. And then there's another tax rate for people with a billion dollars. And, you know, but, and, and if, if we implemented something like that, um, there would be, you know, free daycare, free uh, health care, free education, um, you know, uh, for, for, for everybody, you know, Matt, guaranteed annual income for everybody in, on the planet, you know, we would be able to do that. And, um, and when you do that, it's a different world. You have a world where, you know, um, well, as I'm, you know, as I like to say, you know, when, 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 when we're generous with, when we're generous with people, they don't bust our balls, mm. you know, and it can't cost more than the military costs. Right. No, not my right? can. Right. And yeah, not exactly. <laughs> and so, um, and then we'll still need military or something like it. One of the biggest, here's the most difficult part of my theory, Jacob, the, um, we have to use force. We have to use force sometimes when it happens inside our borders and the police use it to stop a rape or an extortion or something like right. that, a terrorist activity. We're quite, calm, we're, we're quite calm about it. I mean, and actually we require it. We demand it. But when it's across the border, we go, oh, no, no, that's war. We have, we have okay, we can't have yeah. responsibility for those clitorises of the young girls in, you know, um, Sudan, you know, no, right. we should, you know, that's, not, that, that, that's, you know, jurisdiction. We don't have a jurisdiction. Well, we have to get over that. One of the things that I like to talk about is how little we know. You know, imagine how much we learned uh, in the last hundred years. Yeah. I mean, even the last I'm, 20 I, years with the internet and everything. It, Sure. In the last Everything. 20 years, the last 50 years. years. Yeah, but take, pick your number and, and extrapolate that into the next 100. Yeah. That's how much we don't know now. Extrapolate that into the next 1,000. That's how much we don't know now. And we think we know that we can't go help that young girl in Somalia because she's going to get her clit slashed off with a ripped off old tin can top. Um, you know, I don't, that doesn't sit well with me anymore that, you know, some, some idea of like jurisdiction uh, or something, sovereignty mm -hmm. uh, forces us to accept that. And I, you know, I think that among the things we, we don't know that we're going to be learning, and I think I hope quite quickly, is that we actually do have a responsibility to that young woman. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, I'm encouraging people to start thinking about that right now. I, I describe a little bit in my book about how I think things like that would work. Uh, but sovereignty is one of the uh, lamest excuses we've ever had for not helping people, for for not fulfilling the costs of our freedom by helping those people in Somalia. What do you mean by sovereignty in this situation? What? Well, it, we're not allowed to go in there and like force the government there to do stuff. Oh. You know, we we can't because they they are, they are a sovereign government and they say get out, get, stick, take your nose out of our domestic policy. Well, their domestic policy is I own this country and it's all mine, so fuck you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, and it, and then we have to okay, fair enough. You know that sovereignty, man. You right. know, but no, you know. So we have to, you know, we have to. So I'm talking about this in the sense of the things that we don't know yet. We take for granted that sovereignty is. Um, uh, um, uh, a, a limitation upon our capacity to help others. And I think we have to reconsider that. There's really good reason to suspect that we ought to honor sovereignty for some things, but not those, you know, if there are, if there are, um, if, if there are, uh, uh, 
catastrophic breaches of human rights uh, occurring, um, sovereignty cannot be a defense for that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. So we have to go out and force those people too to get into line. And we have to do it by a, protecting the people that are under their uh, spell and, uh, and corralling the people who are perpetrating these kinds of yeah. atrocities. And, yeah. and it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a matter of taste or preference. It's a responsibility. We have to do that. Yeah. It's, you know, what I was thinking about John is like, I, I don't know if this is like a deflection, maybe it's a deflection. Um, but, but I think a lot of times I feel almost crippled by all the things that I should be doing that all the things that like, I wish my life was, um, at least directing towards or, or helping out. I mean, you, you can go on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube or any of these, you know, the, the internet is, is vast for sure. It's a kind of the fungal network of our, of our planet in a, in a sense. So we're able to see, I mean, we can watch videos of these horrific things happening. Um, and we're, we're able to know about all, all these downstream effects of all of our actions. Like we could buy a, a tomato at the supermarket, but we don't realize that the downstream effects of it being shipped over to us, like someone was paid three bucks an hour and then the person who picked it was paid a dollar fifty an hour and they don't have shoes. And there's all these like things that it just seems so overwhelming to, to try to, to try to concentrate on how do I, how, how do I do good? How do I, mm -hmm. um, you know, try to lean into these things? Cause I'm also like, I, I I'm still trying to take take care of myself. I'm still trying to like, all right, I don't mm -hmm. even feel like I have my career set out. I don't feel like I'm, I'm facing, I have all my own shit. How do I, how do I care about that? And then also care about, care about everything else. Like, like what's, what's the balance of, of not being drowned by, by too much um, stuff, you know? I, responsibility I know. of uh, the responsibilities of freedom, you know, the responsibilities okay. to strive to share freedom, true freedom, you know, um, is uh, 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 it is it, it is an res individual responsibility. We should each strive to do it in, in all the ways that we can in our, even if it's just by telling people to read my book. <laughs> awareness, <laughs> right? hey, but, awareness helps. But um, that's also a collective responsibility, and we should be doing all of those things: international development as a as a as a collective, not as an individual. Yes, you have okay. to. You know, we have to worry about the two poor tomato growers in Mexico, but we we have influence over Mexico and the, and their um you know their rapacious uh, farmers who un underpay their workers. <laughs> you know, um, we have influence over them, and we don't exercise it as much as we could. And um, you know, why why is Vladimir Putin using Western banks? Why is his billions in Europe and New York? It why do we let him? Why do we let him do that? We don't have like to. Shell Station or Kellogg's or some some one of these corporations is being benefited by it. I'm sure. Yeah, well, it's it's part of our capital base. It's part of what makes us privileged is to have that capital in our base, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't have to. We 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 can put the squeeze on. Uh, uh, we can put the squeeze on guys like Putin out there in the world, you know, and the Koch brothers and the rest of those. We can put the squeeze on them, you know, and the and the. the, 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 the the juice is worth the squeeze. There you go. Let, yeah, like let me tell you this. Constitutional democracy has created the two most powerful tools ever invented by our species to control the selfish wealthy. They are the powers to tax and the powers to regulate. And the worst thing that we can do in the world right now is discourage young people from becoming involved in constitutionally democratic governments. Say government can never do anything right. Every time they tax you, they're just stealing from your pocket. No, that's wrong. That's what the selfish wealthy want you to think because they want you all to turn your backs on government. They want you to not vote. But the one thing they do every time, all of them, every damn one of them shows up and they vote and all of their minions vote too. And they don't, and they only get, you know, they only have like 30%, 35% of America, but they own it. They're running America because they know what to do with that 35%. They show up. If the 65% showed up, they'd be fucked because they would be seizing, they would, the 65% would be seizing the levers of constitutional democracy, uh, of, of the democratic power, and they would be utilizing the powers to tax and the powers to regulate to end what those guys do. And you know what? It will not be the end of wealth. It'll only be the end of wealth for them. So sometimes, sometimes it it feels like we have to. 
like in in order to feel like we're still playing their game it feels it feels mm-hmm. like um and i guess I, i'm you know kind of inadvertently speaking on um uh like like the people who feel frustrated by the government who think how oh, the government does, doesn't do anything right or um mm-hmm. my vote is worthless or what, whatever the thought is i think that's kind of like where i'm where i'm stemming from but it's mm-hmm. uh it, it feels to me and tell me what you think about this it feels like we need like a like a dr- democracy 2.0 like a like a constitution uh like upgrade or uh uh in these things are great like we, like i'm not the type to like burn it I, let's not burn it all down and see what we have there from the ashes like definitely not but it does feel like we we need some sort of overhaul because there is so many like you said you know 65 percent um there's just so many I, I don't think i'm alone when i say that i don't know who to trust i don't know what the government's telling me if it's true you know in in the news stations have made it more more intense and, and more confusing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um it's it, it's I, I don't know do, what what's the how do we actually make this change like how would you actually see happen obviously it's not going to be an overnight thing but do you think there has to be some sort of um i mean i hope not war but some sort of like defining no. moment of, of change no. or anything or is this a gradual we just start working towards it or five percent more americans need to go out and vote and vote against selfish wealthy that's all and the whole really? thing will change you know they, the and all that you know if we're we're on a cusp now, and you know I'm a Canadian, but and bless your hearts for allowing me to comment on what's going on in your country. But you do call yourselves the leader of the world, so we have an interest in what you do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. But I hope so. You know, um, all of the things that are giving the selfish wealthy their thumb on the weight on this on the scales of constitutional democracy, uh, the gerrymandering, the voter su- suppression, uh, the keeping people ignorant by not providing them with education, uh, creating people who are disabled as to reading between the lines. They, they actually read the lines and believe them rather than <laughs> <laughs> approach them with a, with a sense of healthy criticism. Um, you know, um, all it, all it will take is for the 65 percent in in America to come out and support people who will who 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 wish to um, manage the selfish wealthy. And I'm not talking about putting an end to anybody. All I'm talking about is making sure that those people pay their fair share, right? And that they follow the rules. They don't get to dump mercury into Love Canal and say, I thought it was a free country. I thought this was a free country. Yeah, no. They have to, and and, and, and back to the topic of the moment, and that is we're only about 5 or 6 or 7% of the electorate in America away from watching all of that tumble. You know, all it takes, all it, all it will take is one federal law to make gerrymandering illegal. Can to you make define, vote. Can you, can you define gerrymandering for me? Well, gerry, gerrymandering is, is, when you, is when you fuck with the boundaries of the, of the uh, uh, congressional districts or the, okay. you know, the, uh, um, and they, um, you know, what, so what you do is if you've got, uh, a, 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 in, in, you know, in town, you've got this concentration of liberals, right? Instead of having like, you know, big, uh, three three seats in in town that are filled with liberals. Right, right. What you do is you take this, you draw the seats. So there's a great big swash of the of out 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 in the country where there's conservatives, and then take them into town and take down about you know uh, about a quarter of the liberals and put them out in in a, in a riding that's m- mostly you know uh, people out in the country in, you know, who are more conservative. Mm-hmm. Um, so. You tilt the scales that way with gerrymandering. It's something that you know the your your Supreme Court just recently said we have no interest in this because it's a state matter. But um, I, I think that's fundamentally um, ill conceived. Uh, you know they're 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 messing with the balance of the balance of voting. Yeah. You know, so by gerrymandering and all of the other, you know, by and, and they do do that. They, they you hear about redistricting all the time. That's what they're talking about when you're talking about redistricting. Right. They're talking about changing the districts so that the guys in power can have a better advantage next time. That's mm-hmm. what they're talking about. That's not fair. And if America wants to be fair, they have to, you know, end, you know, the, the, that that politically based redistricting. When they do. The selfish power are going to the selfish wealthy are going to lose their um unequal 
uh, grip upon the levers of constitutional democracy and that the powers to tax and, and regulate. So we're just that close to it. That's the beautiful thing about constitutional democracy. You just have to make sure <laughs> that the majority actually have a say. And when you know when you do when we do that, then um, you know the uh, this uh, uh, un imbalanced uh, uh, influence that wealth has over the system uh, can be eradicated. But you know it's not going to be it's not going to be happening as long as the wealthy guys own the Mitch McConnells and keep sending them back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what's going on. You know you got this. What's this guy? The the who's this? <laughs> you know the. Um, governor in florida what the hell is his name who wants to give you a fine if you tell people to put on a mask i don't want to say his name because he doesn't you know he, that's what he's I looking forgot, for yeah. attention right yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah he wants him. to be the clickbait so he's popular <laughs> that's that's how everybody's everybody wants clout that's what everybody's doing lately we even have Notice. governors and in, in, yeah, yeah. We, it, <laughs> it's actually a you know it's 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 a silly thing because it's you're thinking of like oh you so you're you live in la and you're trying to get known so you can be an actor or whatever it is but it's like this clout thing this this recognition this want for fame this want to be noticed is is really like uh, uh jamming up the 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 drainage system system of 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 our discourse, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're closer than we think to um, to solving these problems. And we just, uh, but, you know, turning our backs on constitutional democracy is exactly the wrong direction to go in. Yeah. It's repurposing it. It's a poor carpenter who blames his tools, right? Hey, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, these, these people are blaming government and not the carpenter. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, the, and they're it's not a, coming up with solutions either. It's like if you have a problem, don't just complain about it and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I've got to sit with it. You've got to be coming up with solutions because it's all it's a we situation. It's a us versus the problem, you know. Exactly. Let me let me go on just a wee bit about, you know, that's a poor carpenter. <laughs> it's a poor carpenter who blames the tools. It's a poor board. It's a poor board. How come I'm so white all of a sudden? It's <laughs> <laughs> lighting. Uh... It, it's a poor board that blames a hammer for getting nailed. It's not the hammer. It's the, it's the carpenter mm. that's, that's doing the nailing. So we have, to, we have to stop being angry at the tool, at the government, and we have to start being angry at the guys who are wielding the hammers and, mm. and change them. It's time, you know, it's, it's, right. it's time to change the batter, man. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, I, I, what I see a lot with, uh, it, it, I think I, I've run a lot of things through the internet and social media. I'm very interested in how, um, the internet and social media and our new systems change, mm -hmm. change who we are as humans and, and really influence us. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. very fascinated by that. I, I think that they're, they're playing us all right though, you know, wrong, but, but they know what they're doing, you know, that they, they have all this psychology on, on how we interact. Basically they're, instead of us projecting our anger at, at them and these systems that need to change and these people that need to get out of their chair because it's time for, for something new right now. Um, they, they make us project that anger at one another. They're like, Hey, you're mm -hmm. either, you're either mm -hmm. red or you're blue or you're this or you're yeah. that. And those are your enemies. Remember if you're the good guys, this is what you are. Oh, okay. That feels good. Yeah. But here's the bad guys. Here's where they are. They're over there. Go yeah. get them. And I, that's precisely right. That's yeah. for sure. You know, the the power of propaganda is the misinformation. Although that's one one of the effects of it. Uh, the power of propaganda is that all the misinformation that propaganda um, pitches us uh, creates um, a lack of confidence that anything at all works, and and then we just mm -hmm. turn our backs on it. And then, man, those thirty five percent show up and they get it all. Yeah, because are. that's the way constitutional democracy works. If I was Vladimir Putin and I wanted to wreck America, what I would do is make sure that young people turned their backs on government. Mm. If I was Vladimir Putin and I wanted to really, really fuck the West, what I would do is I would promote, um, you know, uh, voter fraud, mm -hmm. anti-vax, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, white lives matter <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> right yeah and i'd be pushing those things for all it's worth on 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 on, on so and you know what yeah on, on social media you know what i think vladimir putin's just as smart as i am and he's mm. got and he's got the machinery set up to do it if he's not doing it he's yeah. an idiot 
but I, I, he's, I don't, he's, he's not an idiot and he's doing it. When, you know, when Mueller told us that he was messing with the elections, that's what he's doing. Uh -huh. He's absolutely soaking social media with, you know, propaganda that's designed to destroy our faith in the, in the, you know, in uh, our system of constitutional democracy. You know, and he's it, doing very well at it. And I think right next to it, it's uh, the possibility of conversating out of it is also kind of, kind of. Um, a, I love that idea. Yeah, it's it's a because it's a very as you're telling me as you were as you like named off those three things. I was thinking about how difficult it is to have regular discourse around these things nowadays because there's so much extra with them and there's these weird little. Everyone gets uncomfortable and they're like, oh, oh, it's, I hope they know that I'm that I. I love black people, so make sure I say this thing. You know, it's it, it, it strikes us with this very uncomfortable, weird thing, and we act like knuckleheads. Um, and and there's so much logic that's right beneath beneath the surface. And I I don't know, John. I, I'm excited for us to. Uh, I I think uh, I, I did a good um, session with one of my good friends. Um, on cancel culture and we're basically just like what is cancel mm -hmm. culture like why is it important why is it at the forefront why are we talking about it and we kind of came to the end and we're like it's it's dumb like what why are we spending so much time focusing on it why are we we we're kind of talking about like the pop culture side of of mm -hmm. cancel culture but um it's uh our conversations are kind of being taken from us in a strange sense um, mm -hmm. So we need to be able to, to, to have the discourse about it. I, I forgot exactly the point that I was trying to make on that, but uh, I think it is important that we have discourse around these things and not be afraid to, to, to speak on them and figure out what we really think about, what we really mean, what we really are trying to say here. Mm -hmm. one, of the, uh, one, one of the things I picked up on this podcasting was a gentleman who uh, used the phrase um, uh, uh, thoughtful management of attention. Uh, no, it's not thoughtful. It's like uh, skilled management of attention. Mm -hmm. And and wh wh what it means is that, you know, we our, our minds are filled daily with all of the things. Okay, you've got another meeting, two, you got to do this afternoon. So I got to get those and I got to, you know, finish my, take the clothes out of the dryer. And we have Peter's coming over for supper in the weekend. He's a vegan and he only drinks white wine. And, you know, it's got to be and all these, you know, I got the golf club. Oh, geez. I forgot the accountants call it. All these things keep, and, you know, they storm us all day long. And, and um, often that stuff is subjects of responsibility. And so we should, you know, by all means, be paying attention to them. So I'm not just, I'm not dissing all of those things that come into our minds because most of them are important. What I am going to say, though, is at certain times during the day, we have to realize that those thoughts are stampeding us and they always will be. And we have to give ourselves the breadth to... Um, Treat them as what they are. They're uninvited guests. They're people who came and knocked on the door without phoning first. They're clients that don't have an appointment. And they show up and they want to take over. And we let them. So, but for half an hour every day, people, I want us to just decide, no, not now. Those are important things. I'm going to deal with them in half an hour. But for right now, I'm just going to shut all of that down. I'm going to sit here and be quiet and see, okay, the part of us that dreams at night, Jacob, the part of us that dreams at night does not go to sleep in the daytime. <laughs> the part of us that dreams at night is there with us all the time. And what I like people to consider is to sit quietly and see what that part of us wants to do with the day right now, with all the things, these things I feel inside, the things that are, you know, that dull ache, where does that come from? I feel so happy, but I'm not sure why, you know, but so no, stop working the, the responsibilities and the appointments and all of those things, push them away like they're, you know, clients without an appointment. And every time we do that, that part of us that dreams at night, that's still awake in the daytime, starts to astonish us with amazing understandings and solutions and, you know, new, new, new visions to strive for. And, you know, and if we do that, every time we do that, it's utterly refreshing. Mm. You know, we were talking before about, you know, uh, do you have to take acid? No, you just have to shut up and let <laughs> this dreamer that dwells within us be free for a moment. Stop you doing it, just exist. And you don't, you don't, you know, and it's not disregarding the things, it's skilled management of attention, paying attention, selecting those things that are actually uh, both important and urgent. 
but if they're not both of those things, they can wait till later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that we're we're also incessantly thinking all the time, so so in depth that we don't even realize it. I got into meditation uh, three years ago. I had a bunch of uh, like mental health and depression and suicidal thoughts and all oh, this stuff no. that that really just uh, it just like hit a peaking point, and I kind of had like I got to do something. So I started learning about my mind. I started learning about what's going on. I started meditating and doing yoga, and uh, I mean th the difference between how my you know interior daily cognition works versus how it used to work me being completely just wound up in all the thoughts of what i think i am and, and what mm -hmm. i'm thinking about and realizing that you can sit there and observe those things and watch them go by just like you can hear sounds and whatnot mm -hmm. uh it's it's it, it's profound I, I think so many people would benefit from even realizing that you're not you're not the thinker of your thoughts you're the you're the observer you're the the conscious awareness of of all this so uh, what do you, do you have a, do you have like a, a sturdy meditation practice or do you, do you just, have you kind of like learned through the years of, of kind of how to step outside of yourself and just take that, you know, 30 minutes uh, of time to just be and, and exist? Is this a, yes. a structured thing that you do or? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, I, I, um, when I was young, I, I signed up for transcendental meditation. I was around maybe 19 or 20. It was after, um, you know, about three years of the world's championship acid trip. You know, one day Jim and I did 20 hits acid each. <laughs> nice. And it was, you, you build up to it, you know, you do this. Kids, please don't pay attention to this. Okay, this <laughs> <Yeah>. part. <laughs> you know, if you do, if you do one today, you have to do two tomorrow and four the next day. Right. But, um, so, um, Where was I going with this? <laughs> Meditation. Yeah. Um, the, um, the, the, the place that that takes us um, uh, is the place that we go when we be still yet still be. That's one, one of the aphorisms from my book that you, you noticed, be still yet still be. And I think it means, you know, to like wake up, but pay attention, you know, wake up, wake up and, and, pay attention it's not you know it's not like grasping a bunch of details and starting to work them out again no it's just be awake for a moment and oh there goes a kingfisher that's a magic moment <laughs> right and yeah. live it and feel it and it takes us to a place so i transit i did transcendental meditation and you know it was a, a bit um it was very, very helpful for me because it helped me understand uh, the part about emptying our emptying our busy little mind for a moment and, and seeing what else is there. Uh, and uh, and, that, and uh, but um, they didn't like a smoking pot, and I couldn't get that. I didn't know what what the heck's wrong with that. I mean, well, how can that get weed little... and transcendental meditation are holding hands, man? Those are awesome together. <laughs> well, they yeah, exactly. That's right. But they used to tell us not, so I, I went on with that. But I still uh, use that technique to meditate, but uh, I don't have a practice of doing that every day. But it has come to the point for me where I honor it every opportunity that I get. You don't have to do it for twenty minutes either. You can do it at every stoplight. Oh, you yeah. know, and every go light. <laughs> isn't, isn't that interesting how you're, um, I mean, for me, that's kind of how it was. My, you start realizing you can be kind of, every time you notice throughout your day, even if it's a hundred times, those are all benefits. Those are all positives. Like, oh, I just noticed that I was lost in my thought. Okay, I'll just return back to being present, you know. Glim uh, glimpses of enlightenment. They're, they're, they're all little glimpses of enlightenment. Yes, sir. Right. When everything and whenever that stuff bubbles up inside us. And it's one of the things I say at the beginning of my book is, you know, that people thought it was sorry. Very, my, my life was so exciting. You know, who, who, who has a third of a trillion or a billion dollars, third of a billion dollars who has, you know, that I, you know, we hit your, your folk, your, your folks don't know this, but you know, I, I was fortunate we hit, you know, um, a, a grand slam home run in seven, <laughs> you know, on the, on the internet and started a business. It was sort of like PayPal of online gambling and um, mm -hmm. it's called net teller. We started that in 2000 and 2003 went public on the London stock exchange. And by 2005, um, you know, it had a market cap of around uh, $2 billion. And I owned about 27% of that. <laughs> wow, man. Awesome. That's and so cool. I managed to pull some of that off the table, but the, um, uh, it, uh, the thing that is the most precious to me in my life isn't that. And the thing that is the most precious to me in my whole life, 
has fallen into my lap no more than it has into everybody's. And that thing is this being a conscious being in the universe. We are the universe's vessels of consciousness. And that is like immeasurably astonishing that, <laughs> that this came yeah. to us and we just disregard it, you know, but, and, but that, and, and that's in you and I, and it's in, you know, the, the, um, the, the starving lady and, and the dying baby in her arms all have that consciousness within them, within us. And, you know, when we realize that all we have to do to access that is just shut up and be <laughs> quiet and close down this faucet of static that comes in, you know, our, our little busy little mind. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and let that magic um, soothe us and entertain us and yeah. solve all our problems. It's like having the most powerful computer that anybody could ever manage free right behind our eyes. You right. don't even have to, you don't even have to touch that chip in our ear to make it happen. It's yeah. like there all the time. It's our default and, operating system. If we just shut up, like you said. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be wealthy. Uh, but it gave me an opportunity to consider the, um, the responsibilities of wealth are very much like the responsibilities of freedom. Wealth and freedom are very similar. Mm. Right, but the responsibilities of of wealth are to uh, they're the same to try our hardest to assure that those uh, those uh, wonderful benefits are available to as many others as possible too, because everybody else is entitled to it as much as I ever was. I you know how can you be entitled to a third of a billion dollars? Yeah, I earned it, man. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> you earned you, SFA. Right. But um, so be generous, rich guys, just a little bit generous, just 2% generous. And all the world will love you. And they'll come and buy your runners. <laughs> yeah. and, and they'll all look cool when they're dancing to your songs and they'll be watching your movies on TV. You'll be allowing them to make their own content. It's not going to cost much. A guy pointed out to me, Joe Devoskin said, you know, this, this little tool in my hand, it's, it has more production power and better production value than the whole of Rockefeller Center did in 1970. Mm -hmm. And everybody's got it. Moreover, Jacob, it's got all the knowledge, more than all the knowledge that appears in every university library on the planet. Mm -hmm. So all of that knowledge, the cumulative knowledge of our species is now available to everybody in the Sahara Desert. Yeah, it's all one they of the have most to, profound things that's ever happened to humanity. You know, like, and so, and, and all we all we have to do is provide a little bit of guidance to those people, not so that they'll go out and buy our Hummers. No, that's not what we want. What we want is for them to be able to do cartoons and or, or write books or you know write little love stories or you know do little films or whatever it is, and you know make a living for themselves in their own community and improve improve their home their 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 own human resources. We if we you know, there's, you know, 80% of the people in the world, um, if, if we improve their human resource in each of them to how our human resources have been tuned up, um, wealth on this planet would be like 10 times what it is now, 100 times what it is now. Hmm. And it wouldn't all be spent on Hummers. It would be spent on smart stuff, like being generous. Wealth spent on being generous is a way, way bigger dividend than wealth stuffed in vaults under the mountain. I mean, how many how many books have been telling us that the act of service is there's like I mean, there's so many uh, great religious texts or even like Tony Robbins. They'll talk about uh, serving others. Like like when you have something and it it opens up this thing with inside of us that that I don't think we're we're capable of seeing without experiencing it. You know, when we're when we're giving, uh, when we're teaching. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it, it's like a little gift. It's this, this little little secret gift that we're all supposed to lean into. I think is is serving others. And when we and, and when when we do it in in the in the way of um, improving their self sufficiency, not not only do they look after themselves, they're proud to look after themselves. Oh, yeah. You know the 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 intuition that 
people had about the human nature when we, when you created America, you know, Adam Smith thought that he, once again, he called people men quaintly, men are basically good, right? That was the whole fundamental idea of American constitutional democracy. If we turn good men free, only good things will happen. A problem happened, for instance, we created, you know, uh, legal persons that weren't men, corporations. And corporations aren't good. <laughs> corporations yeah. are utterly neutral. They have a responsibility and their responsibility is not to be, you know, cor corporations don't get in trouble for fucking other people's wives. They don't <laughs> follow morals. There is no, they have no obligation to follow morals, right? But anyway, so at, at its origin, America <clears throat> had this extremely positive um, concept of the value of human nature. Now, look where it's come to. Now, if we give a guy 400 bucks during COVID, we're going to turn him into a bum. Hmm. If we give a guy 400 bucks, we're going to turn him into a bum. We're going to make him, you know, a lazy, uh, lazy ass guy for the rest of his life. That's right. not a very elevated view of human nature. I don't buy it. When we help people, 90% of the people we help are going to run with it and be proud of it and make something of themselves and get out there and really you know, earn some money and pay some taxes. <laughs> That's what they're going to be doing. <laughs> and everybody knows that, Jacob, that 10% of those people are going to, you know, fuck us for the money. They're going to take it and they're just going to go, you know, smoke weed and drink beer and, you know, stitch everybody else, right? But that's not, that, that does not exonerate us from our responsibility to the 90% who actually are going to take it and do good. And, 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 and honor Adam Smith's idea that people are actually basically good. If we give them a leg up, they're going to go for it. And they're going to, they're, they're going to proudly look after themselves. And if, if you care about it, and I don't coming off our tax rolls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, brilliant. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of different areas that I'd like to get you started on. I feel like we could talk for a long time, John. Um, well, so I'm, 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 I'm good for two more hours. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, uh, as much as I wish I could, I actually do need to get, I have a, um, uh, like I said, I do, 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 do DJing as well. I have to work uh, in a few hours, but I also good. have a show in Washington um, this weekend. So I've got a lot of DJ work to do. So I, good I do for you. To, well, you're very active. Yeah, yeah, I, I try to be. I haven't uh, been 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 out too much in Austin yet, DJing. Um, but I'm uh, I'm, I'm getting there, slowly but surely. Trying 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 to figure out exactly what I want out of this whole DJing thing and, and what my long term. I I kind of just loved it and kept doing it, and I never really stopped to think about what do I really want out of this. Where do I want to be when I'm older? When it comes to this performing music art DJing thing, so I'm uh, I'm, I'm exploring that. In, in it's super that, important. Jacob, it's super important that, you know, all my environmental friends say, hey, John, how can we like be, have any joy knowing all these things that we know? And I said, you got, you know, what do you think you want to conserve all this for? And they said, what do you mean? That's a stupid question. No, no, really. What do you want to conserve everything for? And they go, you know, well, everybody knows that. Yeah, but what? And I go, you know, presumably it's so that our descendants can enjoy it too. And they go, yeah, yeah, that's so your descendants can enjoy it. I said, now I got them, right? Because yeah, right. I said, okay, so the important thing is, you know, the conserving it is less important. The more important thing is the enjoyment of it. So we have a responsibility to two things for to our descendants. One of them is to conserve it. And the other one is to teach them how to enjoy it. Hmm. That's what we got to do to save this planet is enjoy it. So you man, get out there and play some great music and show people how to dance and then come back to work. <laughs> hell yeah hell yeah hell yeah thank you john thank you oh hey so so i had one more question i'd like to end the uh, uh, try to end the podcast with kind of like a uh, a strange question or maybe a question that that's uh -oh. just f for this guest so a little bit of a curveball but totally n nothing weird uh just in, in in the music world you, you're a musician you've been around um music a lot um i i, I think about and i've actually used the sample before from from uh, uh jim morrison um talking about kind of the future of music back in the day and he was talking about how there be maybe is could be one person um playing from a tape recorder and kind of he was predicting djs in a sense um sure. i'm curious uh what what you think what where do you see the future of music you know i i don't know maybe it's in 50 years maybe it's in 60 or, or whatever where, where do you see us going with music what do you think our i think our creative our i think our creative creativity in that respect is infinite you know give me three chords and there are an infinite number of songs that you can make out of them yeah. and and you know uh 
we're, we're going to, uh, you know, uh, us honkies are going to be learning a lot more about, um, you know, the music that comes from, you know, the, the mountains of China and, you know, the deserts of Africa. And, you know, there's, there's really wonderful things going on musically in Mali now. Have you seen some of those guys? There's some, uh, Mali's a Saharan country, but they have yeah. this great, they, they love Stratocaster guitars and they play oh. <laughs> this very beautiful tradition. So it's, it's, it's going to go wherever releases the soul in the people that are playing the music. That's what, you know, that's what music is. It's like, a, it's an opportunity to take hold of uh, 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 the feeling of uh, the human experience, you know, being a, a, um, a vessel of universal consciousness and what that feels like and translating it into a in universal language that everybody can understand. And the, you take the feel of that and you turn it into music and then you play the song and everybody goes, wow, that's cool. You bet it's cool, man. Yeah. What that is, is turning free in the daytime, that part of us that dreams at night. Oh, hell that's yeah. when we be still and, and still be. What we do is we're turning on that. How infinitely creative are we in our dreams? Infinitely. Yeah. <laughs> Infinitely. Exactly. And we are when we just shut the fuck up. <laughs> yes. Is, right. And so I think where music's going to go, I can't foresee, except I know it will always be going where it moves the musician the best. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I love that, man. That, that makes me feel good because, I, you know, as I, again, I try to figure out my spot and what I, what I want to give to the world as, as a, as a musician or what, what I can discover and show or mm -hmm. what I can make cool or, or whatever. And, and it, that is true. The, the, the moments where I feel like I'm actually directing it or maybe I'm, I'm pointing at it or I'm touching it or I'm whatever are those moments where I'm, I'm lost to it. I'm in it. I'm not thinking about it. I'm, I'm in the flow state of, of creating something, whether it's uh, writing like a terrible piano song because I'm not very good yet at all, or it's just, you know, mashing some songs together. Um, I, I really do feel m most, most like I'm doing the thing when, I'm just, just, just doing it and not thinking about it. Just, just existing and, and bringing forth, uh, in, into the sound waves only, only what I can. So, uh, yeah. Let it be, man. <laughs> hell yeah. Hell yeah. Oh man, John, it, it was so great to talk to you. Um, can we just so, just so we don't, uh, leave it out. Can you drop, uh, do you have, do you have a website? Can you drop the name of your books? Just make sure everybody knows where to, where to find you. JohnLafave.com. Just spell my name right on your little thing there. And yeah, then people yeah. go to JohnLafave.com. There are two books on there. One of them is called All's Well, Where Thou Art Earth and Why. And that's my sort of theory about where, where we are in space and in time as a species. Um, it's a bit audacious, but uh, it's a, it can be gonzo, but it's also very informative. The other one is called Good With Money. I got somebody else to write that. Remember I told you somebody, everybody said to me, I should write this story. It's such an exciting story, you know, about how, um, you know, you turn rich and billion dollars and flying around in jets and all that and going to jail and all that stuff. I didn't really, you know, and I, 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 I tried to I tell people I tried to do that once, but I, I tired very quickly of writing sentences to start with I and end with me. Uh, <laughs> and so I engaged somebody else, Carrie Gold, to help write that book. And that book is called Good With Money. And the reason it's called Good With Money is because she talked to all of my financial advisors and everybody else. <laughs> said They all said, this guy's not good with money. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a book to be to be written there after so, all. So and that and if anybody's interested in like the tawdry story of rags, my rags to riches to not rags, I, obviously. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not ridiculously wealthy anymore, but I am wealthy, and so are you. But I'm wealthier than you are. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's JohnLafave.com on Facebook. You know, you can have this John Lafave on Facebook, but there's also um, I, I run the so-called page, and the page is called Thoughtful Species. So if you type in Thoughtful okay. Species, that's where I put in my commentary about um, about uh, you know social, social, political, you know uh, human sorts of things that. Uh, that concern us from day to day and the different ideas I have. So thoughtful species on Facebook. Yeah. I like that name a lot. That's a really cool name. Thoughtful species. That's good. Um, okay, cool. Well, oh, yeah. John. my, 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 um, my, uh, John Lafave.com also has, you can listen to all of my music there. It's on all of the, uh, you oh, know, it's great. on Spotify and all of that stuff, but you can, if you, you know, you can go to John and all, all, all of the stuff I've ever recorded is there too as well. So you can scroll through some of that and see if the, whatever kind of music you like, there's going to be something there you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True. True. Cool. Uh, Thanks awesome. for having me here, Jacob. It's fantastic to meet you. And I'll look forward to maybe uh, doing this again. If you ever take a notion. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I think so, man. I would, I would like that a lot. So uh, again, man, thank you for your time. Thank you for your, uh, for your wisdom, and uh, I, I really appreciate it, man. I'll. Uh, it's very, very, very generous of you to say generous, but to keep up the good work. Yeah, th thank you, man. Thank you. It'll be, uh, it might be a couple weeks till this gets posted. Um, I'll send you an email when it does, though, just, so, just so you're in the loop. That'll be wonderful. Thanks. All right, take care, man. Listeners, take care of yourself. Love yourself. Do some stretching. Go outside. Take a walk. Breathe some fresh air. Try to get uh, get with yourself. Get with your get away from your thoughts and just exist for a little bit. And uh, drink a glass of water if you haven't drank any water today. Good Peace out. <laughs> See you later, John. Thanks again, man. Thank you. At what age do we learn to have better conversations with ourselves? Knowledge is power.